Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Computers Client Build 15. This is going to be another high-end water-cooled build and it's going into the Corsair Obsidian 900D. It's going to involve a small amount of modding including some internal mods and also custom cables. The color scheme is going to be black and red. So I'm now going to get started with a brief overview of the components. The case as I've mentioned is the Corsair Obsidian 900D. I have the Asus Maximus 6 Extreme, the Intel Core i7-4770K, 32GB of Corsair Vengeance Pro, two Samsung 840 Evo 250GB SSDs, a Western Digital Green 2TB hard drive, three Asus 780Ti's, a Corsair AX1200i, and an EVGA Pro Tri-SLI bridge. For the water cooling components, I have two BitsPower D5 acrylic upgrade kit 250s. I have two EK XTX 480mm radiators. I have backplates for the 780 Ti's. I have two EK D5 pumps, two BitsPower D5 acrylic mod tops, and two BitsPower D5 black sparkle mod kits. I have all EK Nickel Plexi CSQ clean water blocks for the CPU, motherboard, memory and graphics cards. You can see here I have the CSQ clean tops for the memory water blocks and I also have the EK Monarch module adapters. For the fans I'm using Corsair SP120s for both the radiator fans and case fans. So that's most of the components that are going into the build. I'll cover the rest of the components as they arrive, and we'll also take a closer look at some of the components as I'm installing them. So it's now time for me to start this build, and for once I can actually immediately start installing components. This is something I'm really not used to, because usually I need to spend many long hours, days, even months on case mods, so usually by the time I start installing components, I've already spent a massive amount of time on the build. And sometimes the actual build process is only a fraction of the overall time spent on the build due to case mods. But the first thing I need to do is prepare the case. The Corsair Obsidian 900D is an amazing case for high-end components and water cooling. And it's designed to fit radiators into the top front and lower compartment. I'm going to make the most of the lower compartment and I'm also going to install the radiator into the top. You can see I've now changed the internal configuration of the case. I've moved two of the hard drive cages up underneath the 5.25 inch bays and I've removed the other one and you can see there is now radiator mounts in the lower compartment. These radiator mounts actually come pre-installed but they're folded down out of the way. And this is something I really like about the design of the 900D and I think it's something that should be done a lot more often. All you need to do is fold those radiator mounts up and fit them into position if you want to use them. You can also see I've removed the solid covers from the lower compartment on either side. So both sides are now ventilated and a lot of this case is like this and what it means is you have all of these different configuration options available but you don't have to modify the case or purchase any separate components. I'm now going to start installing water blocks. I'm going to start with the installation of the motherboard water block and then the CPU water block. Usually I'd take a good look at the motherboard considering that this is a motherboard that I haven't actually used before. But as always with my videos this is fairly old footage so I'm going to skip taking a look at this board considering that the Maximus 7 series has now been released. But you can see I've now removed the stock heatsink from the motherboard and I just need to clean it up ready for the installation of this amazing looking water block from EK. So first of all a brief look at the EK Supremacy. This is the CSQ Nickel Plexi Clean version. And this has to be my favorite CPU water block, the aesthetics, the performance, just everything about it. This is actually the first time in a fair while I've installed a, a solid, you know, full motherboard water block. Usually they're split into two parts, a block for the MOSFETs and a block for the, the IMC or, you know, Northbridge and Southbridge as with AMD. But you can see that this is a single block that 
covers everything on the motherboard that needs to be cooled. Also considering that there's a PLX chip on this board. But certainly an amazing looking block. It's also CSQ Nickel Plexi Clean. I was able to match up all of the water blocks in this build, which I was certainly really happy with. It's something that I always try to do, but often there is just not you know, the same water block available for all of the components. But that is a really nice looking block. And certainly a great looking configuration overall. Now that I've installed the CPU, CPU water block and motherboard water block. I've installed the motherboard into the case and I'm now going to install the graphics card water blocks and backplates. So there's three 780 Ti's going into this build which is a massive amount of graphics performance and I'm really looking forward to doing some testing and seeing how this system performs. I'd like to see if it breaks any of my records which I certainly think it will. And as always the test results will be included towards the end of the build log. Usually at this point I'd take a good look around at the graphics cards, graphics card water blocks and backplates, but instead I'd like to briefly talk about something else. And I'd like to get all of your comments on this and hopefully create a discussion in the comments. So what do all of you think about the recent NVIDIA releases of the Titan 780, 780Ti, Titan Black and Titan Z? It's a lot of high-end graphics card releases in a very short time and essentially all of the graphics cards are almost the same. And looking back over the past, I don't know, five years or so, maybe a bit longer, at what NVIDIA has done, I mean previously in terms of high-end graphics cards we had the 680 and that was it, the 580, the 480, before that we had the 280 and the 285 and the 295. Before that we had a, a fair number with the 9000 series and I remember a whole lot with the 8000 series, the 8800 GTS, GT, the GTX and the Ultra. So I guess it's just something NVIDIA does every certain amount of time they will release a, a whole lot of of high-end graphics cards in a short time so I don't know if there's any real pattern to it or anything but I'd like to you know have some input on this It's probably somebody with a, a better memory than me but you know is it something that we're going to see more of possibly more frequent releases and also what do you prefer would you prefer less frequent releases and more revolutionary changes, bigger leaps in performance or frequent releases? Because for me as someone who has been into overclocking, benchmarking, breaking world records, I've spent a long time in the Future Mark Hall of Fame, you know it was important to me to have a, a level playing field instead of it being about who could constantly be upgrading, it, you know it should be it's better if it's more about skill. If you have more time between hardware releases, it means you have more time to compete with other people with the same platform. So, you know, I'd certainly prefer less frequent releases myself. It allows more time to really get the most out of the components, to get to know them, and, you know, when it comes to overclocking, to get the absolute maximum out of the hardware. I'm now going to install the memory water block. So I have here the 32 gigabyte kit of Corsair Vengeance Pro. It runs at 1600 megahertz C9 1.5 volts. Before I can install the EK Monarch memory water block, I first of all need to install the EK Monarch module adapters. And these are essentially just memory heat sinks and they could actually be used quite effectively on their own. They look great with something bolted on top you know you could make up something of your own to enhance the air cooling a lot of people comment when I use memory water blocks on how unnecessary they are and this is certainly true the only situation you're going to need memory water blocks for is if you're doing serious memory overclocking otherwise air cooling is definitely going to be enough the only reason I install memory water blocks, it's usually by client request, but the only reason I'd install them personally 
is to increase the complexity of the water cooling loop to improve the aesthetics. All of the water block installations are now complete and you can see I've installed the graphics cards and memory. At this point I can actually start tubing up on the motherboard area between the graphics card water blocks and the rest of the water blocks on the motherboard. And this is often something I'll do. I'll tube up on the motherboard area early in the build and then I'll come back to the tubing later in the build because it's usually one of the last things you do. But the reason I like to tube up on the motherboard area as soon as possible is because this is often the most complex part of a water cooling loop and it's good to be able to do it before the rest of the components are installed which often end up getting in the way. It's great to see that EVGA has released a decent looking SLI bridge. This is something that hasn't really been done before. I mean, I've seen a lot of people modify their SLI bridges, which is always a big improvement to a build because SLI bridges have always been, you know, such an ugly part of a build. So this is an amazing looking SLI bridge. It has white LEDs installed by default. And I think this is going to match up nicely with the nickel plated water blocks. I'm now going to install the Asus Sonar Phoebus. It's been a long time since I've installed a high end sound card into a build. It seems that most people are happy to use onboard sound even if the quality is not that great. I think most of the systems I build are used for you know just everyday use and also gaming and for a lot of gamers you know, it takes a trained ear to really notice the difference and to appreciate good quality sound. So onboard sound is often enough. I must say I used onboard sound for a long time, you know, right from the beginning when I became interested in computers. But once I purchased a high-end sound card, there was no going back. I think the first sound card I ever purchased for myself was the Sound Blaster Autogy 4. And, you know, even just for gaming, the, the quality, the ability to, you know, hear where your, the opponents were was just awesome. And I had 5.1 surround sound set up. But, you know, with the improving quality of onboard sound now, particularly on some of the latest Asus ROG motherboards, there's becoming less and less of a reason for people to purchase sound cards. But obviously there'll always be a place for them, for the people who really appreciate sound, audio files, you know, the ability to customize op amps and things like that. But that is also becoming possible on some of the latest motherboards. So it's going to be interesting to see where onboard sound goes. I'm now going to assemble and install the pump and reservoir configurations. Most of you will certainly be familiar with these configs by now. I've used them many times over the years in previous builds, and I've also covered the assembly many times in previous videos. Some of you might have noticed that the Black Sparkle mod kits have been updated. Now these used to look the same as Bitspower Black Sparkle fittings. They had the same finish, so they had a gloss finish. Now they have more of a matte finish. And I'm not sure about this, I do like it, but you know, I would prefer it if they match up with the black sparkle fittings. But possibly Bits Power is going to release more components with this particular finish. So, you know, then the components will match up. Now Client Build 12 was the last 900D build I did. And that was also a dual loop water cooling system the difference was I was using EK pump tops and reservoirs. I mounted the pump and res configs side by side on the back of the hard drive cages. To be able to do that, I had to do a small internal case mod. I basically just made a plate which I was able to mount the pump and res configs to. And I'm going to have to do something similar in this build Again, I'm going to mount the pump and res configs side by side on the back of the hard drive cages. The only difference this time will be that the mounting system will be slightly different. I'm going to come back to the installation of the pump and res configs in the next part of the build lot. Some of you might be wondering why I haven't already installed the radiators. 
It's common sense to install the large heavy components at the beginning of the build and then the smaller more delicate components later in the build. So installing the radiators is usually one of the first things you do in a water cooled build. But the reason is I had to paint these radiators and I didn't want to let that hold up the build. And I actually paint a lot of my radiators because I'm not impressed with the paint jobs on most radiators. They usually have a very weak matte finish. It's usually powdery and by the time you pull them out of the box, they're scratched and scuffed and you know really marked up. So I just prefer to paint most of my radiators and I've painted these in a midnight black acrylic lacquer and it's certainly a big improvement. That concludes this part of the build log. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and favorite if you want to see more.